In this video, we're going to talk about the seven things you need to know when you're pulled over for DUI in Arizona. One, if you're driving, you get pulled over, you think it's a DUI stop. The first thing you got to do is acknowledge that you're being pulled over, you know, put your blinkers on that you're going to pull over to the right, find a safe place to stop and do it safely and as slowly and responsibly as possible. You're being judged. Okay. So you need to show a proper stop. Once you're stopped and you're waiting for the cop to come and talk to you, you need to actually prepare your documents. Okay. Get your driver's license out get your registration and get your proof of insurance have everything ready by the time the, get, the cop gets to your door this is why officers during a dui stop they are making assessments of your impairment to drive from the moment they see you okay so they're looking for what they call cues of impairment right which is like signs of impairment or whatever you want to call that so basically you're driving too slow you're swerving within your lane you're straddling the lane or you almost hit the curb or you stop and go whatever they see as bad driving they'll write it down and they'll use it in their reports okay so one of the things they do is they have like they are also cues of impairment when they talk to you, right? So the first thing is, you know, order of intoxicants, bloodshot, watery eyes, all these signs and symptoms of intoxication, they put them in the reports and they're looking from the moment they stop you, they're looking and they're writing those down. They're taking notes. The officer's going through a mental checklist, of all the potential signs and symptoms of impairment they know based on their training. And so they can put it in a report because they're actually building probable cause to arrest you for DUI. That's basically what a DUI investigation is all about. Finding probable cost to arrest you and then after arrest then they go into the blood draw and all that and we'll talk about it a little bit later okay so one of the things that they actually look at is the way you respond when they ask you for your documents so if you take too long or you're fidgeting with your paperwork oh well you have bad dexterity right so that's a cue of intoxication and it's a sign of intoxication right because i guess they assume that you know everybody would be able to take out their driver's license from their wallet and would have no trouble with it we know that that thing sticks to your wallet you're sitting on it and then it gets hot right so the best thing to do is to have all your paperwork in an easily accessible place ready to go. I, for example, have my registration and my proof of insurance in a little envelope in my center console. So by the time the cop gets here, I have everything in my hands. I just give it to them. So make sure that you have everything ready by the time the officer gets to your door. Okay. And stay calm. Do not get out of the vehicle. Stay in your vehicle. Number two, be nice. There's no need to be rude. There's no need to be difficult. Okay. Remember one thing. Cop has a lot of power during that stop. A cop can decide to do a lot of things, right? The sole objective of this encounter for you is to end it as soon as possible so you can go on your way and go home. The more time the cop spends with you, the more stuff he can get to build his probable cause to arrest you for DUI. So be respectful, be nice, and don't play any games. Now, there's a key thing here that you need to understand. Being nice does not mean waiving your rights. You should never waive your rights. You have your rights, you're entitled to your rights, make sure you exercise them right now three you don't have to answer questions so if the officer comes over and tells you hey how you doing where you coming from where you're going you don't have to answer that the biggest question is have you had anything to drink tonight now, most people say no some people actually say oh yeah just just one if you admit to drinking there's no way that cop's going to let you go without doing a full-on dui investigation okay and it's probably you're going to get arrested if you admit to drinking, right? Because a DUI said just punish driving while impaired because you had something to drink, right? Or s something to smoke, right? If you admit that you had a drink, even if you, I had one beer, well, he has a reason to investigate whether you're impaired now because you've admitted that there's alcohol in your body, that there's an intoxicant in your body that could potentially impair you to drive. You should never admit that you drank, but you should not be lying either because lying to a police officer is also a, a criminal offense. So what do you do? decline respectfully to answer questions that's it that's all you got to do basically the cop comes you give him your information you have a duty to identify yourself give him your name give him your driver's license you should give him your registration and your proof of insurance because the less things he has to put on his report about you the faster you're going to go home okay so just give him those there's some people that say you only have to show it to him not give it to him there's some people that like put it on the, on the glass and say like, i won't roll out the window and stuff that's just games there's not going to get you anywhere Yes, the statutes say display and exhibit, but you know, playing games is just going to delay and just, you're probably going to piss the guy off. It's probably not a good idea. So just give him your paperwork, be nice, good evening, whatever, and shut up. You don't have to answer anything else. If he insists, you can say, officer, I respectfully decline to answer questions. Am I free to leave? If he says you're not free to leave, he's going to call it a, no, you're detained pending investigation. They love that word, detained. Their law is pretty clear. If you are not free to leave, your rights 
rights are there. Your Fifth Amendment right to remain silent, your right to counsel, it's all there. Just be nice, be courteous. As an officer, I respectfully decline to answer your questions. Am I free to leave? No. Very well, officer. Thank you. Then in that case, I would like to speak to an attorney before I answer any of your questions. Thank you. And that's it. That's all you got to do. The officer says, you don't have a right to an attorney. Well, let me talk to my attorney. He'll tell me if I have a right or not. Right? I just want to talk to an attorney, right? All you want to do is get some advice as to what your rights are, because you don't know what your rights are. And he doesn't represent you. He's not your lawyer. He has a job to do. He's investigating a DUI. And he wants to make sure if he has probable cause to arrest you, right? So exercise your rights, invoke your rights. Be very clear. Very clear when you ask for an attorney, be very clear. Some people say, well, do I need an attorney? That's kind of like some people call it unequivocal, like a doubtful claim. So just be very clear. I just want an attorney before I answer any questions. I want to know my rights. And they have to respect that. So a lot of people like to talk their way out of these detentions and these investigations. That never works. Talking just gives them more to use against you. Remember, anything you say will be used against you. So the less you say, the less they have. Now, this whole you don't have answer questions has one, it has a couple exceptions. You know, you have to give your name and stuff, but you comply with your obligation to identify yourself and stuff when you give them your driver's license and stuff. But there's one other thing. There's this statute that, you know, you need to be aware of because I'm telling you not to answer questions. So I'm just going to read part of it. So it says that if you're carrying a concealed deadly weapon in a means of transportation, such as your car, your motorcycle, whatever, and the officer asks, you if you're carrying a concealed deadly weapon you must accurately answer that question to the officer failure to do so is a criminal offense called misconduct involving weapons now that's beyond the scope of this video so i'll just leave it there but if you guys are interested and want me to talk more about what your duties are when you have a weapon in the vehicle and stuff like that leave a comment and you know if enough people are interested i'll do a video on that and we'll go really in depth on those issues okay but now going back to this video right so respectfully decline and if he insists just ask for an attorney and move on don't fight with him you don't have to fight with the officer just be respectful but be very very clear of your invocation of rights Okay. Now, what happens if he asks you to get out of the car? He's probably going to ask you to get out of the car. If he's doing a DUI investigation. That's probably a given. He's going to do that. So do you have to? You do. Remember, there is a statute that says that a person who willfully fails or refuses to comply with the lawful order or direction of a police officer invested by law with authority to direct or control or regular traffic is guilty of a criminal offense. So yeah, if he asks you to get out, he's doing an UI investigation. Whether it's uh, legitimate or not, whether it's lawful or not, leave that to your lawyer. You probably don't want to get into that because the officer is pretty much going to be very, very, very convinced that his order is lawful. So if he asks you to get out, be very careful how you get out, slowly respectfully no sudden movements you don't want to freak the guy out and you don't want to give him an excuse okay to say that you did something wrong if you are injured or any way or there's just anything that would hamper your ability to get out of the vehicle normally make it known and i'm going to explain why you know how i said that everything the officer sees he's going through this mental checklist so the way you get out of your vehicle the balance the coordination that you show when you do so he will also notice and if he sees anything he'll put it if you're holding yourself in your car if you're like kind of pushing off the car stuff like that you know that's something he'll definitely use in his report right so if, let's say if you have a bad ankle or whatever make it known so he'll probably eventually bring you to the side toward his vehicle or to the side of your vehicle maybe to a sidewalk or something and that's fine be respectful comply right please the less you talk the better your case is so just say yes sir no sir move and that's it if he starts asking questions against officer i respectfully decline to answer questions am i free to leave if he says no ask for a lawyer move on it's his investigation if he prolongs the investigation for too long there's also some certain defenses you would have in that circumstances okay because he can extend the investigation more than reasonable based on what he's doing and clearly a judge will decide later if he went too long it's not for you to decide your job is to be respectful, be very clear about your invocation of rights, and not to get into more trouble. All right, so then what happens next, right? Five. Okay, so now, once the officer pulls you to the side, if he's doing an investigation DUI, the first thing he's going to ask you to do is do field sobriety test, right? So there's three main field sobriety tests, right? It's the horizontal gaze and nystagmus test, or HGN, is the walk and turn, and the one leg stand. So briefly, I'll go over what they are. So the horizontal gaze and nystagmus test is checking for horizontal gaze and nystagmus in your eyes. It's a test where he actually takes a pen or some kind of little light or something and just kind of puts it back and forth in front of your eyes. And what he's looking for is how your eyes move, how your eyes move and follow and hold as you're following that little stylus or whatever he's using as a point. So basically one of the things is like lack of smooth pursuit, right? So instead of your eyes just going smoothly back and forth, your eyes were just like, you know, move like that, like jitter 
back and forth, right? Another thing they do is like maximum deviations, or so they, he, he holds it all the way to the left at certain angles and stuff. And then your eyes are looking like that and they're going back, 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 back. So that, for example, that's kind of the stuff that he's looking for. But basically he's looking for jerking motions in your eyes, right? So horizontal gaze nystagmus is a neurological condition that's caused by many things. Some people just have it naturally or some medication will cause it, right? And having a certain amount of alcohol in your system will also cause nystagmus, right? But having nystagmus does not mean you're impaired. It's just possible, but not necessarily. It can even be caused by alcohol and still you're not impaired. I believe you can even have an nystagmus from alcohol at 0.05 or something like that. So it's not something that is proof positive of impairment, but it's another cue, right? It's a big cue. So the walk and turn, right? So he tells you, okay, walk this line, nine steps one way, nine step the other, and you have to turn a certain way. He demonstrates three and does one turn, right? You have to go heel to toe, keep your hands to your side, whatever so basically it's basically testing your balance you know your coordination stuff like that the other one is the one leg stand you know you would lift one of your legs you about six inches off the ground or whatever and you come one one thousand two one thousand three one thousand until i tell you to stop so they actually let you go really long usually not all the time but usually i've seen many body cam videos that they just let you go a lot of people get tired and just stop well stopping before you're told is not following the instructions and that's a cue so they're just looking for cues of impairment to have problems Cause. Anyway, you don't have to do them. It's your choice whether you're doing them or not. I would never do those. You decide. So a lot of people call me and say, oh yeah, I passed those tests. And uh, bad news, you can't pass them. They're, they're not pass or fail. It's just degrees of failure. At least that's the way I see it because this is how they're graded. Either you had no signs and symptoms or you had some signs and symptoms. That's it. So either zero or degrees of how much you fail. And if you have zero, they can still arrest you. In my personal opinion, nobody passes those. That's why I don't think they're fair because there's no way to pass them. Either there's no nystagmus, there's no cues of impairment, or there are cues of impairment. And if there are no cues of impairment there, the cop has a bunch of other ones, right? He's got, you smelled of alcohol. You admitted that you drank alcohol, right? You could not get your driver's license out. You weren't driving well. You were swerving, right? He has a bunch of symptoms of impairment anyway, right? So I personally don't see the how helpful they're going to be to your case. What I have seen is sometimes there's a disconnect defense that we have. Like when I have a client who does like really good on these tests and you know it's on video then i mean if they come back with a really big bac you could say well that cannot be him because somebody with that bac couldn't walk like that right so that's one of the defenses that you can come up with that but in balance i don't necessarily think they're that helpful but you know you think you're going to get zero signs you know have at it it's up to you okay now six the pbt the preliminary breath test or portable breath test whatever you want to call it is that little handheld device that they have you blow on right the one you see on the movies and on videos all the time, right? That's a that's a little tiny one that's handheld that you just put on new straw and make you blow, right? Again, you don't have to blow on that one. You can respectfully decline. Those devices are very unreliable. They're notoriously unreliable. They're so unreliable that they're not admissible as evidence in court for purposes of any BAC or whatever. But what the cop is using it for is to confirm that there's alcohol in your system, right? The last nail in your coffin. Oh yeah, I confirmed that he had alcohol. So now I'm going to arrest him, right? If you want to know that night where you are, once you're released, go and get a blood test. They'll give you an independent advisory that you can get a, your own test. Go and get your own test. If you're really curious, do it that night. Go get it, right? That helps. Most people can't get one at that time. Usually it's at night and everything's closed. And if you're really curious, go do that. I don't think the PBT is going to help. It's a very inaccurate device. If it comes really low and then the blood comes really high, they're going to say, oh, that's not admissible. You can't use it. So there's another breath testing device, which is different. I still don't think it's very reliable, but it's definitely more reliable than the PBT. In Arizona, we use the Intoxilizer. They have the 8,000 and 9,000 here in Pima County. You know, it's a big kind of gray box. You know, I'll show a picture here. The guy's got a long hose and you blow on it and stuff. It's it's a little different. That's a little more reliable than the PBT. I still think that they're not very good pieces of evidence because there's a lot of issues they have with them, but that is beyond the scope of this video. If you guys are interested and want me to talk about all the ways you can defend against a breath case and DUI, leave a comment. If enough people are interested, I'll do a video for you guys, okay? We'll go really in depth on all those defenses. But anyway, going back to this video, you don't have to do the PBT. Just say no, thank you. Once you're arrested, things change. Once he actually, the officer actually tells you, you are under arrest for driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs or whatever it is. At that point, you do have an extra duty. There's something called an implied consent. They'll read you what's called an admin per se implied consent affidavit. 
It's one of the documents that you'll get once you're released. What is this document? Basically, the law says that anybody who drives in the state of Arizona has given implied consent to tests of their bodily fluids to determine the content of alcohol in their system. There's a bunch of requirements. There has to be probable cause, et cetera, et cetera. But for your purposes on the side of the road, that really doesn't matter. If the cop puts you under arrest, then the implied consent statute applies. So you actually have given implied consent to that test. If you refuse, the officer can do two things, nothing or go get a warrant. And they actually, they get those really fast, the warrant, they sometimes they call them in, but now they actually do them through a computer. I don't know if they use email or text message or what, but it's all via electronic. And sometimes here in Pima County, we get warrants from judges in Maricopa County and stuff, you know, it's, it's very common. If you're under arrest and he starts reading you that implied consent affidavit, the admin per se implied consent affidavit, he's probably gonna get a warrant. So here's the deal. At that point, do you have a decision to make whether you consent or you don't consent. If you don't consent, the cop's gonna go get a warrant. Gets the warrant, he's still gonna get the, what he wants. So he'll ask you for breath or blood. Sometimes they ask for urine, but that's very rare. I've only seen that where they can't get blood and stuff. Usually it's gonna be either breath or blood. Most of the time it's blood, okay? He'll ask for a sample and you can accept or refuse. If you voluntarily comply, they'll just get the sample, whatever there's blood or breath, and that's it. If you refuse, he'll go get his warrant. If he gets a warrant, he's probably gonna get a warrant for blood. He's gonna draw some blood. And if you refuse, they can tie you down and take it. Bottom line. If he gets a warrant, he's going to get his blood. The decision you have to make is this. If you comply, there will be a suspension on your driver's license for your DUI for 90 days. It's 30 days full on suspension. And if you qualify and if you're you know, first time DUI and stuff like that, the following 60 days, you can get a restricted driving permit. So you would only be not driving for like 30 days. If you refuse, that's an implied consent refusal. What's going to happen is they're going to suspend your driver's license for 12 months. On a first time DUI, you might be able to get an interlock instead of that, but still a year instead of 90 days. If you're under arrest, I think your best option at that point is just give them the sample, but that's your choice, right? Just consequences. You're probably going to get a 12 month suspension. So what happens after that? Well, once they get their sample, they'll do a bunch of paperwork and eventually on a regular misdemeanor DUI, eventually they'll release you. Sometimes they'll book you. Sometimes they tow your car. Sometimes they don't. They, they kind of have some discretion on that. And then they'll call somebody to pick you up, get you an Uber, send you home. Some cops will even drive you home. It just depends on the cop. And they'll give you a paperwork and you'll go on your way. If you get arrested, they'll take you to jail and they'll process you in. They'll book you and then you'll see a judge. The judge will determine your conditions for release. Eventually either set a bond or release you on your own recognizance and you get a new date. And those are the seven things you need to know when you're pulled over for DUI in Arizona. If you want to know what to do after you release from a DUI arrest, here's a video I did that explains to you what's next, what you got to do after that arrest, okay? Take a look at it, you know, and that might give you some more perspective and understanding of what you do. Go take a look at it. If after that you still have questions, feel free to give me a call. Uh, there's a link also to book a consultation with me directly down in the description. I'm here to help. Uh, good luck with your case and Give me a call.